Welcome to the Walled Culture Podcast, where we take a look behind the copyright bricks, blocking access to knowledge and innovation. I'm Carla Nellington, and our Walled Culture guest today is James Love, who's the director of the non-governmental organization Knowledge Ecology International. Welcome to the podcast, James. We've I, I, One of the things I think is most interesting about you is the varied nature of your uh, career. Early on, you worked in the fishing industry in Alaska, then returned to education, where um, you took a master's in public administration from Harvard and a master's in public affairs from Princeton. And James then spent 16 years with Ralph Nader's Center for the Study of Responsive Law. And he's currently the director of Knowledge Ecology International, KEI, which is a Washington, D.C. and Geneva-based NGO. His training is in economics and finance, and work focuses on the production, management, and access to knowledge resources, as well as aspects of competition policy. And he's also an advisor to a number of United Nations agencies, national governments, intergovernmental organizations, and public health NGOs. You've had such a distinguished career fighting against many of the most stifling aspects of inter international copyright and uh, patent law, some of which we'll come to in a moment. But what sparked your interest in intellectual property issues around patents and copyright, particularly in so many critical public interest areas? Well, it's... Uh... It may be a little counterintuitive, but my work in in Alaska after after I worked in the fishing industry, I I, I started a nonprofit organization that was a public interest group in Alaska, and one of the issues we were engaged in was the way that the state of Alaska, which was a big landowner, would lease its uh, oil oil resources, and a, a, an issue that I became interested in was the the way the information was managed in terms of the oil resources. For example, some companies would have more information through seismic studies or wells that they drilled about whether there would be oil under the ground than other companies. And it would influence the way that the, the government would think about leasing uh, or selling off of its oil resources because it would create a, asymmetries of, of uh, of power and, and, and information between people that would have a material impact on, on, on what was best for the state of Alaska in terms of getting money out of uh, its, its natural resources. When I was in graduate school, I, I discussed these problems with uh, one of my professors, Joe Stiglitz, who was then, uh, you know, he had not won the Nobel Prize yet, but he was, he was on his way to getting the Nobel Prize for his, his work on information and uncertainty and risk. And, and that was the thing I was interested in. I began to sort of see information as the sort of emerging issue of my generation as opposed to, for example, uh, natural resources or energy, which had been a, a big focus before. And I, so I became very drawn to the idea of, of uh, that. And then, and then uh, that, that uh, later, uh, that, that was, uh, when I was in graduate school, that was the same time you really began to see the explosion of the use of computers uh, uh, in, in the very early days, at least, anyhow. So I was involved at a very early stage in the conversations about whether or not the internet should be made more public and under what governance structure, uh, what type of intellectual property protection should be applied to data, how copyright should be applied to the internet. So I was I was very interested in these in the sort of early days of policy making about expanding access to the internet and also the way that. Uh, other types of rules uh, would, would apply to the internet. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> I mean, there was quite a few things that were involved in that. Um, I, I worked for a while for a, a private consulting firm developing databases uh, before uh, uh, before I, I, I joined Ralph Nader. I mean, I, I worked for a while as a, you know, I, I was in graduate school. I worked for a while, I, I taught um, at a business school briefly, and then I was hired by this consulting firm. And one of my jobs was to develop databases for big clients like IBM or, 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 or Shell, other, other companies in, the, uh, in terms of managing their pension funds. 
And in assembling these databases, I became aware of the fact that a lot of the data that we needed to create analytical tools for evaluating their investments was created by the government, but only available from private for-profit companies at very high prices. And I began to investigate the, 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 the policies that were creating barriers for us to acquire free rights to data that we would need to create databases. And then it became obvious that there was much, much broader issues about, about the restrictions on access. It began to change the way people think about how information would be used. Um, then when I left this organization, I went to work for Ralph Nader. I was asked to look at the, the way the government manages its own databases. And I became a, a real big advocate for eliminating these, these, these monopolistic policies and, and creating more open access to government funded databases. I started a, a campaign called the Crown Jewels Campaign, where we talked about SEC filings, uh, uh, patent filings that were then available just from commercial uh, developers, uh, copies of bills that were pending before the Congress, um, and a number of other, um, you know, an, uh, you know, an, another uh, like a, a, a large number of large databases. I became interested initially. Uh, very interested in the idea of databases and data and was pushing for these policies to demonopolize access to SEC filings, to copies of uh, patents that were filed, bills before the legislature. And part of the conversation was that when it's really expensive or behind paywalls to get access to data, it changes who has access to the data and how the data is used. And w one consequence is people with a lot of money have more power because they have more information than people that have less money. So it, it had a political um, aspect to it, which you know I thought was quite important. And the other thing is that the uses are very different. For example, in the SEC data, when it was really expensive to get filings, you had, uh, you had uh, primarily people that were trading st stocks and, and, and hedge funds really being able to afford the data. Occasionally you'd have an investigative reporter have some limited access to filings because they were so expensive. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have a more general public being able to use these filings to understand more about what corporations were doing, what their finances were. You didn't have academics working on them. There was a database on, uh, uh, on, on um, well, there was problems on all sorts of databases, but if you had databases, for example, on weather data that were being privatized and restricted access to weather data. You had problems of people, just contractors going out trying to pour cement or things like that, making you know, bad decisions because they didn't have access to very good data. So we found is that the argument was as the prices went down, the data was used more intensively for new uses and a lot of times unexpected uses, things that people hadn't really thought of before. When the uh, uh, President Reagan, when he, when he opened up access to the uh, G, uh, GPS data, the Global Positioning Satellite data, after, um, in order to, to deal with a, a, almost a, a, you know, like a, a, a problem of a plane being shot down over Korea. And, and that, that, that led to an explosion of new uses of GPS data. I mean, now we just take it for granted that if we're going to drive to some someone's house, we're going to turn on our smartphone and hmm. get a free signal and, and, and go there. And, and, and we can locate all kinds of businesses and things like that. That's just taken for granted. Those, those services just really didn't exist before. And so when, when you make information available really for free or, or at the marginal cost of making it available, uh, it was a positive thing in terms of innovation, new uses, creative ways people would think about uh, 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 making services available. And so I was, I was really wrapped up in the idea of making access to information more equal and less expensive for everyone and trying to really knock down the barriers. In, in the course of doing that, uh, it, uh, it initially it wasn't really thought it was an intellectual property issue, but then there was an effort in the Congress to turn, to create a brand new intellectual property right in government databases. So you could privatize the data in a, in a way that wasn't currently possible in the US. 
it was a bill that was introduced in Congress that I got very involved in. And then there was a treaty that was proposed in, 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 in Geneva, the World Intellectual Property Organization, to create an entire treaty to uh, assign property rights in data that was in databases. So I got involved in, 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 in these discussions, and this led me to have more interactions with copyright professors and other people that were following copyright. And one thing led to the other, and I think I... Um, I, I started out really working on data, and then I got, eventually I got more interested in the broader issues of, of copyright as well as patents and other types of intellectual property. Well, the, that, that involvement with um, uh, databases is maybe a good place to start. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about because you had a, um, there was that, um, there was that proposal for a a, a, a a treaty to protect non copyrighted elements of databases, and you got involved in 1996 with Richard Stallman to create the Union for the Public Domain. I think was your organization to work to defeat that proposal. And um, could you go into a, a maybe a little more detail about what were the problems with that proposal and that idea of privatizing those databases. And then as database copyright now exists in the, U in the EU, I wondered if you could highlight maybe some of the real world consequences of what happens that you would feel are, are detrimental when you do protect these aspects of a database. The, the, I think the, the proposal, which comes up back and forth from, from time to time, is the idea that if someone makes an investment in collecting data and making it available through a database, that they should somehow be able to ex, uh, exercise some downstream control over your ability to reuse the data, that they could essentially become... I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't so much, in theory, the data would be owned by anyone, but if you got it from someone, it would then attach some ownership of the reuse of it to the extent that you got it from this, you know, from this person or this company or this, this service. That was sort of the story. In some cases, that kind of breaks down because some cases, the originator of the data and the owner of the database is the same person and it may be the only person you could get it from. But uh, uh, in, in terms of the government databases, uh, uh, Mead Data Central, a company called Mead Data Central, eventually acquired by Lexis and West Publishing, now I think owned by, I'm trying to remember who, I think, I think they're owned by Thomson these days. Uh, uh, so those are both foreign, foreign owned. Uh, they started out as American companies and are now really, I think, owned by, by uh, big, big, big multinational companies, primarily located outside the United States. They, uh, they were both interested in the idea that if they acquired data and you got a court, you know a patent application or a court decision from West, West wanted went, went to be able to like somehow claim some ownership of the of the data because you got it from them. Um, well, we were we were uh, 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 we we thought there was a lot of we wanted to protect the public domain nature of, of the data itself. Uh, I, I, I'll just give you a kind of a, in the run-up to the 1996 diplomatic conference, I started to write these memos about, or these, 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 these reports, these, these, these uh, briefing documents about the way government databases would be changed under the terms of the treaty. How would it affect access to SEC filings, to bills before the Congress, Bureau of Labor Management statistics, you know, different, different kinds of data that you, you have out there. And I, I had a conversation with this, this uh, legislative staffer. It was not too friendly to our position. He was very close to the, the database companies. His name was Robert Gelman. He now works a lot in the privacy area. But Bob was telling me, he said, look, nobody really cares about government data. Uh, they care about sports, you know, they care, care about sports statistics. They care about, you know, things like that. They don't really care about government data. And, you know, I, I, my initial spot was, no, government data is really, really important. I mean, it's about the weather. It's about, um, it's about all sorts of things, you know, that are, that are, that the, the people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about getting access to scientific. Uh, there was databases on scientific abstracts. 
for medical research, for environmental research, for all, you know, I, I just, you know, I collected all kinds of information by these government databases. And I thought, no, these, uh, these government databases are really important. But then I thought about what he said. I said, well, l l let, me, let me broaden my horizons a bit. So I did interviews with the general counsel or the key legal people from the National, uh, uh, National Hockey League, uh, the NFL for, uh, for football, the National Football League, Major League Baseball, and the National Basketball Association with those, those institutions. And um, I interviewed people about the, how, the, how the treaty would impact the dissemination of sports statistics. And in particular, one of the things that back then people read newspapers, and one of the things people read newspapers for was to read the sports page. And one of the, if you're a real sports fan, and I was at the time, box scores were a really huge thing. You want to know the batting average of your players. You want to know uh, the, the earn run average of the pitcher and everything like that. And I was walking people through how the treaty would affect the ownership of the statistics, which were collected and disseminated by the, through the leagues themselves. And then I, I, we, we, I put out this report, or our organization put out this report on, on sports statistics. And this was really picked up in a way that none of our work on government-funded databases really had taken an interest in. And some of the organizations in, in, in journalism circles were kind of shocked by this. And, and they contacted the White House and they said, well, are, are you doing something in Geneva that is going to change the way, you know, <laughs> what we do in terms of... Uh, box scores on, on baseball games and things like that. What, what are you up to? And that set, set off little arm, alarm bells in the White House because they, they hadn't really thought through, you know, what this proposal would do because the U.S. at that time was supporting the proposal. Uh, Bruce Lehman at the time was the, uh, the head of the patent office and he was, he was pushing for really expanded intellectual property rights everywhere. And then we did another report on uh, the finance sector and, and whether stock trades and, and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, would be covered uh, by the database and financial data. And then Dun & Bradstreet and Bloomberg, which were both in the database business, began to look at this and they began to think through that what they do, it, it requires them to get data from third parties. And the treaty was going to create problems in getting data from third parties because the third parties were going to be able to prevent them from essentially, you know, it would make them pay. They would maybe block them all together from getting data that they would need. And, and, and they didn't really think they needed intellectual property rights in, in the data to protect their business. They thought it's very difficult to do what they do. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, they had paywalls. They had, uh, they, you know, the data itself was you know, stored in service somewhere that was kind of hard to replicate. It was a lot of work to keep everything up, up to date. And so in the middle of the negotiations, they came out against the database treaty. So you had West Publishing uh, and, um, and Lexis pushing for the database treaty and so a, a handful of other companies. But then you had these other companies like Dun & Bradstreet and, and Bloomberg, which are trying to assemble all kinds of data. It's sort of the beginning of kind of the early days of the big data movement, I guess, where you're seeing these companies sort of seeing the, the database tr treaty is, is really not in their interest. And we were able to flip the U.S. position in the middle of the diplomatic conference from supporting to opposing the database treaty. So there was d different texts that went into the d diplomatic conference in Geneva in 1996, one on the WIPO Copyright Treaty, which is now a treaty, one on the WIPO, WIPO Performers and, and Producers, the White Phonographs and Producers Treaty, the WPPT. And then there was the Database Treaty, and the one that we opposed was stopped. And, and it, you know, it's never, it's never become a treaty. The European Union went ahead and they implemented database protection, but what they saw was the U.S., is now a bigger source of, uh, you know, a bigger supplier of databases than the European Union. I mean, the U.S. tech industry took the freedom that was associated with being able to acquire and assemble data in, in a way that allowed them to really do a better job uh, at, at creating useful and interesting data sets than, 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 than the European companies were. And the Europeans have subsequently evaluated their directive on databases and Bernd, uh, Professor Bernd Hugelholtz from, from Amsterdam is one of the main critics of the database. And he's, 
and he and other people have said it was really been a failure. But the European Union, it was, I, I think, it was quite interesting. They said they acknowledged that the database treaty is essentially a, a failure. They tried to they've tried to moderate some of its negative effects by just not enforcing it very aggressively or trying to kind of trim its sales and how it's interpreted. But they said they can't really get rid of it. They said once you create a new intellectual property right, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. So there's this idea that it's sort of an upward ratchet on IP. You can sort of go up. It's really hard to go back down. You can expand. You can take, like, for example, the copyright term. You can take it from 25 years to 50 years to 50 years plus life to 70 years plus life. It's pretty hard to go from 70 years plus life to 50 years life, even though the last 20, the last 25 years after you're dead really has no benefit to the, to the, the current authors. Yeah, but the person who did uh, the so, work in the first place. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a problem. So, um, and then and of course and then getting to meet uh, Richard Salman, uh, I, I met him earlier when he was uh, concerned about a a different issue. He was worried about software patents in the North American uh, Free Trade Agreement, and he'd reached out to Ralph Nader, and I was put in touch. I was considered kind of the geeky guy working for Ralph Nader at the time. I was the person that uh, uh, liked computers. Had used computers very early. Had written some code, not a lot, but <laughs> at least some code. Um, and I, I was sort of focused on these on, on these emerging issues. And and uh, uh, the conversation with Richard Stallman about uh, patents in the in the North in, in the North American free trade about about software patents uh, were kind of interesting for me. Um, I just want to mention one, one formula of experience I had kind of early uh, on this sort of transition from looking at domestic issues to international issues. Because I started working on these information issues really around 1990 uh, for Ralph Nader and expanded to medical technologies in 1991. I started out with just databases and government funded information. I expanded it much more broadly in the following years. But it, until 1994, it was essentially a domestic concern I had. I wasn't really thinking about the, the whole world. I didn't, you know, like most people, I probably didn't, at the time, uh, most most people were not traveling as much as they are right now. They didn't have the internet, so they didn't really have as much contact with people outside the United States as they did. And it just seemed kind of difficult to imagine doing anything at an international level. Also kind of irrelevant. A lot of Americans thought that, you know, what, what happened outside the United States didn't really have anything to do with the United States. I was at a a Senate hearing on an issue about patents on drugs. And one of the senators asked if the U.S. could resolve the monopolistic problem on patents on drugs by doing what Canada had done a few years earlier, which is to issue compulsory licenses on the use of the patents so you could permit competition, even if there was a patented invention, uh, in return for some royalty going to the patent holder. So the patent owner would get paid, they'd have some economic benefit of holding the patent, but they would not be able to exercise a monopoly. And they, were, they, they brought this up. And then I was sitting next to Ralph Nader, and Ralph, and Ralph Nader said, well, but compulsory licensing is uh, going to be outlawed by uh, the NAFTA agreement. I mean, it didn't really outlaw compulsory licensing, but it definitely restricted it in a pretty substantial way. And the, and the framers of of, of NAFTA thought it was going to end compulsory licensing. At least that's what they wanted in terms of drugs. That was what they hoped it would happen. And I was sort of shocked because I, I was looking up, I was in the, you know, I was, I was one of the people testifying and uh, the senators are kind of on these tables, you know, in front of you, but they're like a few feet higher than you are, you know, they're, they're like kind of a, an imposing figure. And I, I've seen these people on television before and was kind of awestruck by the moment being there. And I heard these people explaining that there was some a trade agreement that was being <laughs> negotiated that would prevent my own s senators and members of Congress from being able to write the laws that they wanted to do. And it was, it was kind of an eye-opener for me. I began to understand that it's no longer the case that your own parliament, your own legislature, the people you vote for are completely free to write the laws that shape your lives. You have to worry about also, in addition to all that, you have to worry about these international negotiations. And very shortly after, I was very, became very much involved in 
the international dimension of these negotiations. And the, the first impactful thing that I did was really the opposition to the 1996 uh, database treaty. Okay, well, and the, your, your involvement on the health front has remained a really central part of, 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 of your career. I, I wanted to touch briefly on that. It's a little to the side of, of, of the central issue of, of world culture, but, but given the times we're in and that years and years and years ago, you were looking at tr the idea of the TRIPS waivers, the, the need to open up vaccines and, and um, important medicines, especially the antiretrovirals in, for, against HIV, to be used against HIV in countries like South Africa, where you had um, countries without the financial ability to pay um, the prices that the drug companies were asking for. Um, I just wondered in our current um, COVID moment, do you feel, it, it, it must feel strange to see so much international focus and daily focus in newspapers on these issues. And have we, did we move forward at all in these areas, in your own opinion, or are we still stuck in the same um, arguments? Well, I, I, I'm very much involved on a day-to-day -day basis on these negotiations with WTO right now on the and it, it's been a very disappointing negotiation in the sense that the initial proposal by India in 2020 and, and South Africa to broadly waive requirements that the WTO has on intellectual property rights during, during the pandemic, just for COVID-19 and just temporarily, which was actually, we thought was a pretty narrow proposal because it wouldn't go beyond this one single virus and it was just gonna last for a couple of years. And that was met with tons of opposition from not just the industry, but from governments and particularly like the European Union uh, was, was probably the lead. Germany was the most vocal, I think. But uh, it, it wasn't just, a, you know, it was also Canada. It was, it was quite a few countries that had uh, in the UK had really opposed this. And the U.S. position was, has been a bit, a bit problematic as well. So... I look at the long arc of the time I've worked. I started working on medical technologies around 1991. Internationally, I began to work on them around 1994. And I'd have to say that there's been, as you mentioned, there's been some positive developments in the sense that we're able to liberalize access to generic drugs for HIV in about 115 countries, um, involving about 85% of the people living with HIV at the time. And that's been, a, I think, to this day, that's a fairly successful part. But if you go to, like, cancer, it's like, oh, the old school. I mean, it's really very unequal, and there's really been almost no concessions in, in, in that area. And if you look at COVID, you would have thought this would have been the moment because everyone was scared. In 2020, nobody knew who was going to, uh, you know, be able to do anything important. Germany passed a law essentially eliminating patent rights, exclusive rights on patents, for COVID-19 um, in, 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 in March of 2020. And Canada uh, passed uh, also some legislation in this area because neither Canada or Germany at the time really knew who, if anyone, would come up with any kind of game-changing technology for COVID-19. People were really panicking. But as soon as, uh, that didn't last very long, as soon as Germany reckoned that they had some domestic vaccine technology from either CureVac or BioNTech, and as soon as the United States thought that they had um, in Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, Novavax, and, 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 and Pfizer, some domestic champions, you begin to see things really change. Also, Bill Gates was interesting because Bill Gates, who I, I, I first got to work, with, work on uh, issues involving Microsoft, looking at the problem of the monopoly they were trying to extend on the, on the browser market. Uh, and particularly the 1997 antitrust case, where I was the lead person for Ralph Nader, the technical person, uh, you know, on, on these, uh, uh, on trying to get the case brought in the first place, and then trying to manage the process going forward, and sort of explaining to people what the anti-competitive practices were and why they were important. Ralph, Ralph's inter interesting enough is uh, not someone who uses a computer, but he was pretty savvy when it came to understanding. Uh, some of the threats, I mean, in, in a way that I found surprising because he, he, he wasn't like a computer guy, but he sort of got it uh, at an important level. Um, but then 
later, Bill Gates pops up as a big figure in, in, in the issue of medical patents. And I was just blown away by that. I, I just felt like, how did, how, how did that happen? And a lot of it's very ideological with Gates because Gates just believes in strong monopolies. I mean, he just believes that like, you know, myriad technology with like some, some for-profit firm and it's quite essential for everything to happen. He thinks that, but he's, he's an extremist really. But because he's also a philanthropist, he has a, an outsized influence within the public health community. He's a big funder of a, a lot of public health programs and academic institutions. He's a, a big funder of the WHO. He's managed to get uh, his organization on boards of the Global Fund for AIDS, Malaria, and Tuberculosis on Unitaid. He has a special relationship with the World Bank. Uh, he knows heads of states. He's, uh, he's, uh, he, has, he has uh, an amazing entree and a lot of focus on this. And he's, he's thrown his weight behind very policies which, are, which are, uh, have blocked a lot of the attempts to do reforms in this area. But I, <laughs> I think I'm getting a little far away from your question here. <laughs> That's okay. That, but... I, well, no, it's fascinating to get some of that, that context because what you're really... I think what you're, what you know through your own experience and through these decades of seeing these um, <clears throat> situations unfold is you're really outlining how um, certain vested interests can really uh, plant themselves in front of uh, movements forward, and also that when lawmakers come to a point of negotiating global treaties or making national laws, it's it's sometimes um, they can have many unforeseen consequences, some of which you've outlined as 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 well. Um, and two other two other things I'd love for you to touch on is one, the Marrakesh Treaty, and second, the broadcast, the proposal on, on broadcasters and copyright, um, because these both bring all these issues together as well. The Marrakesh Treaty, I think, is a really interesting area. Can you talk about that? Because this is something that you would have thought everyone would have said immediately, there's, we should obviously um, enact something like this, and yet there was opposition from vested interests for so long that it took ages to happen. Um, could, you, could you explain what that treaty is about what it, um, and what was achieved and maybe where things stand right now with it? Yeah, that was a, a, a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to work with. Um, the blindness community on this project. The way it came about was I was involved in, uh, since around 2002, we, we began to, our organization began to have a regular present, presence at the World Intellectual Property Organization negotiations on the Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. And we were really interested in other issues, like we were, there was an attempt around 2003 to create a broader work program on copyright exceptions ac across all kinds of areas like education, research, teaching, quotations, um, and, um, archiving, di different areas like that. Uh, and uh, I was very interested in opposing this idea of a broadcast treaty very early, because which we thought had many of the same problems that the database treaty had, because it was essentially, it still is an attempt to get an intellectual property right on information that is not owned, created, or even paid for by the broadcasters, just on the basis that they make it available to you through, through their networks. And we we're, continue to be very concerned about that. But in the course of attending these meetings, there was a gentleman from the World Blind Union that used to would be invited in to make presentations about how copyright exceptions related to blind people. And he presented a really interesting issue. He said that many countries have exceptions, not all of them, but, to, but all, pretty much all the high income countries did have exceptions in their law to make works uh, accessible to blind people in the copyright law. And he, he said the problem is, is that those are typically national exceptions. So the United States, for example, which had a large collection of works in English and a fair amount in Spanish as well, would not make those works available to blind people in Canada or the UK or Kenya or India or any other country. And the same thing was true with other, other countries. I, uh, 
in the course of this, I had an opportunity to visit a, a, a library for the blind, for example, in, in, in uh, Uruguay, in Latin America, and uh, they showed me a room the size of someone's bedroom, basically, and it had the entire collection of works that were available to blind people. It was around 3,000 audio cassettes. And their technology was they invite a volunteer in, and the volunteer would read a, a, into a microphone. And I asked them how many books could they do a year, and they said they could do about one a week. So if you're blind, you'd get access to about 50 books a year by this organization. Now, across the river in Argentina, a different blind organization had access to around 20,000 works for blind people at the time, but they were not sharing those work with the people in Uruguay. And, and in fact, the people in Uruguay were probably doing books that were already done in the other country. Some countries in Latin America would have like something like 550 books. And then you'd meet people that were blind people like from India that were, you know, gone to, like this one woman had gone to, she'd gone to law school. And so we asked how it happened. She said she wanted to go to medical school but her way of getting access to textbooks was that her father would read to them the books every night. And that's how she learned. And she said that he couldn't read, uh, he couldn't read the medical text very well. So she became a lawyer. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you sort of get all these stories and you realize that th this should be a fairly simple problem. You know, what, what I thought you could have a an agreement that could write on one page that would say that if you have an exception that's similar in both countries, that you can exchange the works across the borders between the two countries. And I approached, uh, at that point, there had been a new representative, Chris Friend, uh, of the World Blind Organization uh, in Geneva, and I, uh, my, uh, Menno, who was a lead for us on the copyright issues, uh, who was who, my wife, and we, we worked together, but she was working more on the copyright issues than I was. She had she set up a meeting where we met with uh, 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 Chris and and his wife, and we and and, and we said, "Look, I, I think you can you can I think we can fix this problem. I think you could actually do a treaty, a white book, to fix this problem, to to create mandatory exceptions for cross border use of um, works for blind people. So if you if you make them in one country, it can be shared with blind people around the world." And I said, wait, you know, if you if you're interested in working with us, we can we can go further. So then they said yes. So then we convened a meeting in 2008 in our offices in in Dupont Circle in Washington D.C. And we invited uh, people from around the world. Then we we invited uh, the the expert to WIPO, uh, uh, Judith Sullivan, who'd, who'd written a report for them on this. We invited um, people from different blindness organizations, not only in the United States but in in, in foreign countries. Um, librarians, uh, uh, law professors, we had like a, 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 and some country negotiators like from, from Chile and other countries. And uh, Ruth Okajita, who's now at Harvard, but she was then, uh, she was one of the academics that came in. And I, I drafted a, uh, what I thought a treaty would look like to, 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 to do this. And uh, we vetted it and I had put it through a second draft because people, you know, there's a lot of issues we didn't understand very well because I and on that field, like I, I just didn't really understand much of the technology, or some of the, some of the thorny issues that came up. But this was then became uh, a draft that was circulated to governments in the fall of 2008, as and it was decided to call this the uh, the World Blind Union proposal because they were normally an NGO couldn't really float something that. At, at the World Intellectual Property Organization, but we thought the World Blind Organization might have, you know, like a little extra flexibility in this department. And uh, we were hoping to have a country introduce it initially, uh, but we, we, you know, we just weren't going to wait forever for that to happen. It's very difficult to get a country to table a text for a whole treaty. But uh, what happened is that uh, the text was circulated, and then uh, it, it turned out there was a... Um, in Ecuador, there was a, uh, I think the vice president at the time uh, was had a very close ties to people in the blindness community. I, I can't remember if he was blind himself or not, but he was, he was, he was very interested in this issue. So Ecuador at first and then, and then uh, uh, Paraguay and some other countries sort of stepped up. And then Brazil uh, uh, kind of also stepped up. And Brazil decided to introduce the proposal in 2009 as the 
as as the World Blind Proposal, but it was it was a it was a, it became an official WIPO document because it was put under their name, and they they suggest this become a uh, the negotiating text. Obama was then uh, had, had just taken office in early two thousand nine, and there was a couple people in the Obama administration that were very, very favorable uh, um, uh, to, to, to this moving uh, forward, and some people that didn't like it, but. Uh, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, for example, was working in the White House at the time, and he was, he was quite open to this. And uh, Artie Rye was working in the patent office. She thought this was a positive thing. Um, and um, <laughs> I, I'm missing out some uh, important people here, but uh, forgive me for that. Uh, but there was a, <laughs> it was a cadre of sort of supporting people. So there was initially some support uh, for the, 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 this to move forward, but then some of our supporters left at the end of 2009, and things got a bit tougher with the Obama administration. The Obama administration ended up opposing this as a treaty all the way into the diplomatic conference in 2013. They they really opposed this becoming a treaty, I think, all the way through the first week of the diplomatic conference in 2003 in Marrakesh. But it took five years to go from um, us holding this experts meeting and drafting a text in 2008 to having uh, a UN treaty approved in Marrakesh in 2013. What, what was, and can I ask was, you, what was the opposition? What was, why, why was there such strong opposition to this? Well, the, the initial opposition was from the publishers and the publishers uh, did everything you could imagine to derail this. And they, they suggested they 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 uh, would do something voluntary. You didn't have to do anything mandatory, and they came up with a proposal, an ABC project they called it, um, and and they were initially going to take something like ten books, uh, or may, at one point maybe a hundred, but like really tiny numbers, and and do it and do like five countries and show you how you could share share things across borders or something like that. And they evaluated for a period of three years, or I mean, it was some like ridiculous proposal. But they were initially trying to get the secretary to go along with completely voluntary measures, and it was just a huge amount. In the beginning, a lot of people just said that this broke the mold. They said that intellectual property rights sent mandatory rights and limits on exceptions. So what we proposed was mandatory exceptions. And limits on rights. I mean, we flip things around, and they didn't like this. They thought this, you know, was 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 sort of breaking the copyright system. I mean, they they they, they didn't like the a lot of this was not about money, but it was probably about precedent. I would have to say that as time went on, we we had the resources, thankfully, because of uh, financial support for the negotiations from the Open Society Foundation, to to help bring a lot of blind people in. To, to, to the negotiations, the, 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 the blind organizations. So there was a lot of blind people there from around the world. Uh, and, and, and they were just fabulous. I mean, they were all like really articulate. They were very, they'd be there for a week with the delegates. The meetings would last a week. And so you'd have these blind people in the back of the room, a lot of them, you know, with canes or with service animals or dark glasses or different things like that, or no glasses, but like clearly couldn't see. And you would observe these people trying to navigate, you know, using the using the restrooms, crossing the street, you know, finding their way around. It was really heartbreaking to, you know, to sort of see the challenges that they faced. When you're, I mean, it's one thing to talk about blind people. It's another thing to spend a week with 20 blind people in a negotiation where you have like close physical contact and they're and they're telling their stories or making interventions. And they're becoming people. They're not just like statistics. You know, it was it was just it was just really became um, it, it became a, a highly charged, and there was a, uh, a you know just emotional negotiation that was going on. And so eventually, you saw the publishers uh, uh, on the scientific side, like Lexis and people like that. Um, and then uh, the Germans were very tough. You know, Bertelsmann and you know, uh, you know all, all these big uh, German, French, uh, and, and Dutch publishers, and people like you know Swedish publishers. They begin to eventually kind of can sort of accept the idea that this was eventually going to 
gonna gonna go forward. Yeah, the people that were primarily in the room were the scientific and and book publishers, uh, educational publishers. You had Pearson, you had uh, Random House, you had Penguin, you had uh, uh, the scientific journals people. I mean, they were, you know, and they sometimes they'd express concerns like, well, you know, if you create accessible versions for for blind people, that's gonna that'll be like a a loophole for people to, you know, overcome our digital rights management or technical protection measures or whatever. I mean, a lot of it was sort of piracy related. Sometimes it was on the compensation side. They were kind of worried about how broad the definition would be for, you know, beneficiaries and things like that. But those things slowly, and it was slow, but they eventually came to terms with that in part because being in the room, you could not help but to be moved by the stories of the blind people and just begin to sort of accept the idea that this was a massive policy failure that had to be fixed. Now in 2013 when it began to move toward a diplomatic conference then there was a new form of opposition and that was initially from the Motion Picture Association. The Motion Picture Association became a huge problem in moving the treaty forward. They, they really began attacking it. And I think this was a case of people that were not really, you know, had not really paid much attention to negotiations before. They weren't that involved. They weren't, they weren't sort of emotionally co-opted like everyone else is. They, they were just kind of strident. They saw this as a, they claimed this was just some big attack on digital rights management or technical, you know, privacy measures, which was, it was, was, was definitely not true. Because the, the people that were making works available to blind people often were using technical protection measures and all kinds of sophisticated things like that. To, and you know it wasn't that easy to get works that were made available for blind people, and they were they were and they the people that were involved like Bookshare and people like this that were providing these uh, works to, to people with disabilities were were very clear and they were showing up and but anyway that the motion picture people were really really aggressive, particularly Paramount, Time Warner, Fox, Disney. I mean companies like that. Disney was 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 a big problem here, and Paramount. And uh, so that, then we had to kind of deal with that. The blind people took to taking billboards of uh, uh, the CEO, for example, of Disney and, and, and you know, putting them on a 70-foot billboard overlooking a freeway, you know, uh, uh, complaining about their opposition. Then at, as we begin to kind of eventually make, make headway with the motion picture people, uh, by the blind people pushing back against them and, and, and using their own lobbying and advocacy efforts, then there were, the last group was a group led by General Electric, and they mobilized patent owners. They they took a lead for something called the uh, Intellectual Property Organization, and then in, in Europe it would be uh, oh I forget the name of some of these trade groups in in, in, in Europe, but they were eventually, eventually a bunch of businesses that were involved in, and it had sort of client related technologies or medicine. So you had you saw Monsanto. Uh, 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 GSK, Exxon, uh, Caterpillar, General Electric, you know, companies like that opposing uh, the Treaty for the Blind. And, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, what, what does, the, what does I, this I, have I, to do with weird. any of the, with Caterpillar? <laughs> and, yeah, I actually, I actually contacted the CEO of, 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 of Caterpillar because he was involved in the Easter Cecile, which is a disability rights thing in the United States. And I was like, what, what, do you even know what's going on in your, your, your company's name and the logo? Now, we, we contacted some companies and they didn't, they were not only aware of the fact that their, their name was being used in opposition and, they, and, and Microsoft was actually, to their credit, was the first big company to come out and, and diso disassociate himself with the opposition, say, we support the treaty. So, you know, we do not agree with this letter that's being circulated in our name. They did that before Google would do it. I mean, it was really Microsoft was the first big company to come out and, and, and sort of push back on the, the sort of Chamber of Commerce type opposition to the treaty. But the argument against the treaty was that it was a precedent that would find itself into uh, climate change negotiations that were taking place at the UN then on patent rights and things like that on, on patent rights. And I said, look, it, there is no slippery slope when it comes to these measures. I mean, it's really, really hard to do anything at all. And yeah, it, it, it's a precedent, but it doesn't really buy you much in these international negotiations. I can't just walk into the climate change negotiations. Look, we got an exception for copyright for blind people. Do you, will you roll over right now on 
patents on uh, battery technology. It's just, it just was kind of ridiculous, I thought. But part of what you saw is that the lobbyists that work for these guys, they weren't the companies. You have to think of them as a separate industry. You have the people that publish books or make movies or make um, uh, batteries or, you know, things like that. And then you have the people that are lobbyists. And the lobbyist is a separate industry. And so they market their services to the people that make batteries or movies or books. And they sell, give us money to stop this bad thing from happening. If this thing happens, it's going to destroy your business. Please give us money. So they basically exaggerate whatever threats they see in whatever you're trying to do. So they can get money to stop what you're trying to do. And, and there was a fair amount of that uh, um, uh, they, they have terms for it in the, in, the, in, the, in the PR business about how you sort of scare the bejesus out of your corporate clients so they give you money to sort of stop fund. some bad thing happening. But it, but it um, got through so eventually. <laughs> the treaty did it, get it through, through eventually. It, and not only that, it, was, it, it had the most signatures on its first day open for signatures of any treaty in the history of intellectual property. It's been the fastest treaty to be ratified and it, it, it's, it, it, it's breaking all records for the number of countries to sign it. So even the Trump administration, Trump signed a ratification during his term. European Union has ratified the treaty. I mean, it's been a huge success, and, and not only has it been a success from a from a sort of symbolic way, but it's it's had a practical effect. I mean, like it's it's radically changed the availability of works for blind people around the world, and so it's it's it, it has been a great success. And it was one of, the, of my great pleasures in my life to have spent five years working on this project. <laughs> well, like you were you 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 noted at the very beginning that it came out of it was sort of a, a it came up as a side element when you were looking at the broad proposals on this broadcast treaty. Could we briefly just touch on that? You noted that the intent was to give broadcasters a right to um, to creations that they hadn't actually created. That there's there's some interesting issues around that. Can you just explain briefly what it is and and where that stands? right now? Well, they, the, the broadcast treaty is now entering its 25th year of negotiation. <laughs> so, None of these things moves quickly, do they? <laughs> and, and, it, and it's evolved over time, and it's still kind of up in the air about what it really is, because one idea is that you're just trying to take an older convention called the Rome Convention, which was adopted in 1961, which dealt with radio and television over the air, you know, that were basically then free services. And you had broadcasters that had some public service obligations in return for this, you know, using the public airwaves. And they had lobbied at that point to be given some intellectual property rights so they could make money if you played a TV show or a radio show in a bar, for example. Or you know if 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 if, if, thing, if, thing, if things were sort of commercialized in certain ways, uh, they they wanted to be um, you know if the collection society was out there getting money, they wanted to get some part of that. Since then, you've had uh, encrypted communications, paywalls, wired services, and now uh, it's not like you just turn on you know your free cable services; you have to pay for it. And you have all these services over the internet, and if and if you want to get Netflix, you probably have to pay for it. There are free services, but you have to pay. You know, watch the ads. I mean, I mean, there's not it's 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 not the same as it was, and there's just like uh, an explosion of innovation has taken place through the internet. So you have audience interactions. You have people streaming. Well. You know, I recently had somebody stream a mass murder. I mean, you have people streaming uh, negotiations at WIPO. You have people uh, streaming a uh, game playing on Twitch, a um, uh, more legitimate use of the service. You have, you have people uh, st streaming uh, basketball games at the junior high school. You have, um, you have, uh, uh, um, I mean, Zoom has made everybody basically a broadcaster, right? <laughs> it's really, it's really distance education has really taken off uh, uh, through the pandemic. Uh, uh, I think people want uh, the sort of time and place of your choosing for um, 
services that used to be provided through network television. Uh, you know, they like to binge watch things. They like to watch them when and if they, you know, they, they want to. They like the variety. Um, they like the catalogs. That do, you know, now, you know, it used to be, uh, when I was growing up, you know, there'd be movies that would be out there and catch the movies and then that would be it. And then, and then later there was VHS or then, you know, D DVDs and stuff. You, you, but now, now practically everything that's ever been made is potentially available right now to the internet and, and the amount of content that's been generated is massive. The amount of hours per minute that's uploaded to streaming services now is just, it's just, uh, just, just huge and from all sorts of different suppliers. This is all taking place without any special intellectual property regime other than copyright. And so, uh, or, you know, rights that are associated in some countries, they would recall related rights for performers, but the creative people. So we, we have not opposed the idea that you have uh, copyright or performers' rights, people that actually get rights that make things and provide some creative role. We'll have an argument about, you know, how long the term of protection should last. Should there be exceptions for certain uses, quotations, private use, education, teaching, things like that. But the broadcasters, they want rights on things that they don't create, they don't license, they don't even pay for. Uh, they they want they want an intellectual property right. If you have a Creative Commons licensed work and it ends up on a broadcast television or even an infringing work, they want to have intellectual property rights in that, and they want the rights to be at minimum. Well, they've asked for 50 years, but from every broadcast in the treaty proposal, it would be 20 years from every time they disseminate it. So. Uh, uh, that mean you'd have to wait 20 years after you downloaded something or you recorded something from them, even if they didn't own the original rights. And if you if you clear the rights, which comes up from the content owner, it's not enough. You'd have to clear the rights from the person you got it from. And then now BBC and these companies are lobbying for this in these other broadcasts like O Globo in, uh, in Brazil or the Z Network in, uh, in India or uh, you know, North American broadcasters. What they want to do is they... They say, well, they can see the handwriting in the wall. They can see the traditional television is really, you know, w losing. And, you know, the new Internet platforms is, are, are winning. So they want to extend this intellectual property right to deferred broadcast or, you know, just basically anything is transmitted over the Internet. And so uh, among the issues in this negotiation is should there be any 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 related right at all you give to somebody merely because you got it from them that's the, the, different than copyright it's different than you know you know what the creative people would go we we would say that the 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 creative people should get the rights and the broadcasters should have to pay the creative people if they want to get rights to, to someone else's content the broadcasters say we don't want to have to pay anyone to get the rights we just want it to be automatic we don't want to have to pay them, and we want to, and, 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 and we want to have rights on completely public domain material as well. So there's that issue, and then and then there's a the question: of, if you create this stupid right, then how 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 ubiquitous is it? Does it apply to basically, um, you know, Facebook people people using Facebook, you know, to to share videos of their cat? I mean, like, you know, what are you talking about? So this is technical things in the negotiation about when it kicks in and when it doesn't kick in. They have some things like, oh, don't worry, you'd have to call it as a broadcast. But the definition of being a broadcaster is so weak and so low in the treaty. Er early on, we said, like, you know, like the people at the streaming services, they can buy, if, if all they have to do is buy a radio or a television station somewhere on the planet, these big streaming services. And don't tell me that Google or Apple or Hulu or, you know, one of these companies can't buy, you know, a TV station and um, somewhere if they need to, to qualify. I mean, so it's a, it's a really problematic negotiation. Now, the, the, the problem in WIPO in stopping this negotiation is the radio and television people put politicians on the air, obviously, and they do them in a favorable or an unfavorable light. So uh, they have... A lot of influence. That it's not even do, do with the economics. It has to do with the fact that it, it, you know the, the the companies lobbying on this are people that the politicians are afraid of, uh, you know, or you know, I want to suck up to or whatever. So you have 
So India used to be allied with our position, as did Brazil. And in both India's case and in Brazil's case, you had the leading broadcasters interviewing directly, not with the copyright people or the, you know, the trade people in the foreign service, but right with the, the head of state. And, and we were just kind of fortunate that it, our closest ally in this negotiation right now is probably the United States government. And we were always waiting during the Trump administration, is Murdoch going to pick up the phone and tell Trump, you know, he wants to change the U.S. position? I don't think Murdoch really thought this was a very important thing. It's more like the people under him, you know, that were lobbying on this mm -hmm. thing. But so, so it's, it's going. A, it's a, it and so it's an ongoing, ongoing effort. Then to, um, it's been going for a long a time, serious, and it's, it's probably going to keep going for a while. <laughs> well, it, it may or may not. But here's the thing: is if it, it just takes it one decision at one WIPO meeting, uh, uh, once a year, that General Assembly will decide this to move it into a diplomatic conference. If it goes into a diplomatic conference, the odds of getting a treaty pretty high because the number of countries supporting this are almost every country. I mean, it's, you know, like if, if, if in the rooms, uh, almost every company is saying, yeah, well, this is a priority you want to have. They don't even know what's, you know, most of the negotiators don't even have a clue what the contents would be, but they just told that they have to go support it. If it goes into a diplomatic conference, it's going to come out as a treaty. And whether the U.S. signs it or not, it's kind of irrelevant because the EU is, uh, is probably the major driver of this negotiation at this point. And they will put tons of pressure on other countries uh, to, to, to join the agreement. And, and it's a very dangerous negotiation. It's, it's like taking the mistakes they made in the database treaty and applying it to audiovisual content. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's not like there's a very sophisticated uh, understanding by the EU negotiators of where, you know, what the problems are here. Um, and, Here's the other thing is that because the negotiation has taken 25 years so far, the people that were really good that were showing up and opposing this and very articulate, they can't send lobbyists for 25 years to wipe up to stop something that they, you know, so they just, they just stopped coming. So now the number of people opposing this thing is really a tiny number of people like KEI is pretty isolated in these conversations. Now they, uh, there's been, uh, some other, some other groups have, 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 but it's not a priority for very, very many people. And, and the groups that were the, the biggest, you know, digital rights groups and, 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 and consumer groups that were showing up in the past, like EFF, for example, hasn't been to a white media for some time. And so a lot of the groups that used to be a very influential role in opposing the treaty just aren't in the room right now. And, and, uh, so it, it is a it is a very dangerous negotiation from our from our point of view. Now we dodged a bullet this year in the sense that it, it will not be discussed until next year. Now, so we're we're uh, but we will decide in July, I think, uh, or soon uh, there will be a general assembly meeting this summer where the white bull will will, will will again there'll be an effort to try and push a schedule a diplomatic conference. We came very close about twice in the past to scheduling a mm -hmm. diplomatic conference for this treaty. What it, it well it's. <laughs> And and really, we've only just scratched the surface of so many other issues that we could dive into. I mean, even these ones, there's so many layers to them. Um, but but our time, unfortunately, has run out. And, uh, and so we'll have to wind up our own conversation here. I would urge anybody with an interest in these areas, check out the um, keionline.org. Is that it? Um, the, is the KEI's yeah. website. There's blog posts there. You can find out more about their work in these issues. You can follow um, James online on, on Twitter and um, you can, he's Jamie underscore love, at, at Jamie underscore love, I think is the correct um, handle there. And um, for now, it is remains to me to thank you so much for joining me to have this discussion today on Wald Culture. Um, and to our listeners and viewers, thank you for joining us. It's goodbye from me for now, um, Carla in the LinkedIn.